חוציינו ממצרים, חוציינו ממצרים דיינו. אילו אילו הוציאנו, הוציאנו ממצרים, הוציאנו ממצרים דיינו. די דיינו, די דיינו, די דיינו, 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 די דיינו, די דיינו, די דיינו, דיינו, דיינו. Sorry, I think I was muted. <laughs> shalom, shalom, everyone, and welcome to our vegan Passover event. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to be back with you all. Some of you may know me and some of you may not. So I'm Raquel. I'm the founder of Jewish Vegan Life. Jewish Vegan Life launched back in 2020 and right at the beginning of COVID, actually. And so a lot of our activities went online for a while with a lot of live segments and a lot of you joined us for that. And this year we decided to relaunch bigger and better than ever. So we're back and this is our first event since our relaunch, our vegan Passover event. So I'm excited to be with all of you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I would actually like to know where you guys are joining us from in the world. Um, so go ahead and put your uh, name and where you're joining us from in the chat. And we'll check that out and call some of those out so we can see where you guys are uh, located around the world. Um, I'll start. I'm Raquel and I'm joining you from Jerusalem. And we have a lovely uh, segment for you guys today. We're going to be talking all things Jewish vegan Passover. We're going to be joined by our special guest, Rabbi Akiva Gersh, which many of you will know as the vegan rabbi. And we're also later in the segment going to be talking about uh, traditions of the Jewish communities around the world, because we are as diverse as, are, as we are the same. We're one big Jewish family, but we all have different traditions and we all come from different backgrounds. We also want to hear from you guys later in the segment about your traditions and your family traditions. And in addition, at the end of the segment, we're going to be sharing something special. We're launching a very big campaign for Passover, and we're going to be sharing the details of that with all of you, and we're going to need your help to make that happen. So stay tuned for that. And now without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and welcome our guest, Rabbi Akiva Gersh. Rabbi Akiva, are you there? Hello, Rabbi Akiva. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Good to be with you. It's been a very long time, actually. Probably a year and a half or two years since I last right. saw you. Right. It has, yeah. been. It has been. Yeah. yeah. So good to see you. Where are you joining us from today? I'm joining all of you and all of us from Pardes Khanna in Israel, kind of like the beginning of the north between Tel Aviv and Haifa, a nice little town mm -hmm. the ocean. There's a little bit of a feedback on your sound. I'm not sure if it's only on my end or um, in the chat. If anyone can ha is having problems hearing Rabbi Akiva, let me know. If not, it might just be on my end. Um, but let's continue. Um, so Rabbi Akiva, go ahead. Somebody's saying that there's feedback. That's interesting. I don't know what the problem is. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just going to go ahead and ask you a question, then I'll mute and maybe that'll help the feedback. So um, basically, a lot of us know you. Like I said, you're known as the vegan rabbi uh, online. And um, But for those of us who don't, if you would just take a moment or two to share with us about your background, how did you grow up? What was your, you know, uh, what did you eat as a kid? And how did that either influence or not influence your vegan journey? And how long ago was that? So I grew up um, very different than the way I live and eat today. I grew up a uh, very secular uh, Jewish lifestyle, not very connected Jewishly in terms of tradition and customs and uh, um, different observance. And my diet was a fairly very typical, uh, say, American uh, suburban diet. Uh, unfortunately, not very healthy, lots of meat, uh, lots of junk food, and, 
healthy lifestyle or a way of eating that obviously all radically changed at some point in my life, starting towards the end of high school, but mostly in college. Uh, I lost I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's just really hard to hear you because the sound is really, really bad. Maybe, um, I don't know, unplug it and, and plug it back in or, or leave and come back in. I'm not sure how to fix it, but it's hard to hear you. Like there's this uh, buzzing sound as, while you're speaking. Um, sorry, everyone, for those technical difficulties. Maybe you're right, Kiva, if you jump out and jump back in. Okay. Is, that, is this better just in one thing? Is that better or no? No, I'm still hearing it. I'm still hearing it. It wasn't there in the, It wasn't there before when we start when we first right. started. So I don't know. Yeah, um, maybe maybe leave and come back in if you don't mind. Sorry about that, everyone. He will be right back with us. In the meantime, I'm gonna check out where some of you are joining us from. We have quite a few people today. Is someone joining us from Beersheba? Hi, how are you? Um, someone joining us from Orange County, California. We have Hannah from Chicago. Deborah from Pensacola, Florida. Um, we have someone joining us, Phoenix, Arizona. Jim from upstate New York. Hello to all of you joining us from all around the world. This is so, so, so cool. Um, here we have some of it displayed on the screen. We have Laura from Southern California. Um, Miriam from New York. So yes, hello to all of you. And let's go ahead and try to bring Rabbi Akiva back and see if that's better. Fingers crossed. Hello, Hello. I think it's better now. Is it better now? Yes, yes, oh, it is. so much better. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yes, as you were saying, you grew up uh, non-traditional. Yeah, just really quickly, briefly, Jewishly, very, very disconnected, very secular, uh, eating-wise, very unhealthy, lots of eating animals. That's the way I was brought up. That was my community. That was my family. That was the culture that I was in. Uh, in high school, I started getting involved with more, more with activism and started to realize some of the problems in the world that really expanded greatly in college became a main focus of mine during college. And as a result of that, my first year in college, I had lots of realizations about the world, about how we humans are impacting the world in negative ways through almost every single thing that we do, buy, eat, um, and the like. And by the end of that first year in college, this was back in 1994, I decided to become vegetarian. I declared my major in environmental studies. A year later, I realized I should be going vegan for the same exact reasons. And in 1995, I, I went vegan um, and radically changed the way I eat, learned about vegetables and the vegetable kingdom and, and how to eat differently, more health uh, in a healthier way and in a kinder and com more compassionate way towards animals and towards creation. That's wonderful. So it's been quite a long time for you. You're sort of a veteran vegan. <laughs> Yeah, it was a different world back then. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly. Even when I uh, was in the army as a vegan, it was a completely different world to to what it is now and wow. to all the options that my daughter has. Um, okay, wonderful. So let me ask you, a lot of people ask, why should Jews celebrate a vegan Passover in the first place? Is there any basis for it? And can it be as meaningful as the regular Passover? Uh, definitely, yes, yes, and yes. I believe it could be even more meaningful. Um, and I feel that of all the Chagim, of all the holidays that we have in the Jewish calendar, I feel like Passover, I mean, to me, they're all in line. There's something about every single holiday that lines up with the values of veganism, uh, but especially Pesach. I mean, it's all about freedom. It's all about liberation. It's all about redemption. It's all about overcoming oppression. I mean, these are all values that guide us vegans in terms of how we eat. Uh, so to celebrate freedom we're, we're taking an entire night um to sit around a table with food and to celebrate freedom i mean it makes sense that the food that we're eating the food that we're serving the food that we're putting on our table the food that's sitting in front of us as we're talking about freedom and celebrating freedom should be reflecting that value of freedom for all life for all creation it's it, 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 for me it, it's it's such a uh it's just a contrast, such a very stark and heavy contrast to be talking about freedom, celebrating freedom at the same time that the food on the table is coming from places that rob freedom away from God's creatures. So definitely that value of freedom is very much in line with, with Passover. Um, and also, you know, at the very beginning of the Seder, we, we invite whoever is hungry, come and eat. Right? We say this out loud. It's a, it's a beautiful part of the Seder. And it, really behind that is this idea of food justice. 
And we have this value of food justice right at the beginning of the Seder as well, and, and also veganism. And there's many different reasons people become vegan for environmental reasons, for animal rights reasons, for health reasons, spiritual reasons. Um, me personally, I connect to all of those. And if, if we could feed more people um, by choosing a vegan lifestyle, how can we not? Why wouldn't we? And definitely veganism is very much in line amongst other things with food justice and making sure that there is enough food for enough people in this world. Absolutely agree with that. But there's, you know, a question, a reoccurring question that I get a lot, especially, um, you know, in some of the more traditional communities is, is a vegan Passover kosher? Like is hosting a vegan Passover allowed in Jewish law? Is a Seder night that's vegan, you know, allowed in, in proper Jewish law? Uh, I like to say it's super kosher. Um, absolutely. It's like the Mahajan of the Mahajan, I think, right? And so there's two things that people are wondering, right? One, but what if I need to have like certain meat, you know, or animal items on, on my on my Seder plate, right? What about that? If I don't have them, did I do something wrong? Did I not do the mitzvah correctly? And then, and then the other thing is like, well, it's holiday. Do I need to eat meat? Because so many people, especially in the Orthodox Jewish community, <coughs> talk about you have to eat meat on on the Chagim, right? The holidays, Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot in order to fulfill the mitzvah, a mitzvah that we do have, an obligatory mitzvah being happy on these holiday days. Really quickly, just to say um, with the first one, the whole, most of the Seder, we have a few things during the Seder that are obligations from the Torah. That's eating matzah, eating the maror, and telling the story of the Exodus from, from Egypt. Those are from the Torah that we must do. Everything else we do, for, there's some that are rabbinic. I don't want to go into all the details, like the, the four kosot that we drink, the four cups that we drink of wine. But almost everything else we do is minhag, is custom, right? The Seder plate is a custom, right? We have a mitzvah to tell the story through questions and answers, right? And, and the whole Seder plate is one big, beautiful and meaningful prop to help us to do that. But it's not an obligation from the Torah. If I don't have something on the Seder plate, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't take anything away from the mitzvah, from the obligation that I have that night. Right? These are all things to help us tell the story. So if I replace the shank bone with a beet, let's say a roasted beet, great, let's move on. The, nothing nothing lost, nothing missed, nothing done wrong. Right. So that's one thing about the Seder plate. Right. The whole thing is a custom. We have to realize the difference between custom in Judaism and an obligation. And customs are beautiful, but... They're, they're not on the level and they don't have the weight of an obligation from the Torah. The second thing in terms of eating meat on, on Yom Tov, on the holiday, Passover included, th today it says it in the Gemara and Pesachim actually, that once when, when, the, when the temple stood in Jerusalem, so the way to fulfill that mitzvah being happy on the holidays was through eating a piece of, uh, of the animal that was brought as a sacrifice specifically for that holiday. Then the Gemara goes on to say, but now that we don't have a temple anymore, the way that we fulfill that mitzvah of being happy on the holidays is by drinking wine. It's very clear that there's no longer an obligation in our day and age to eat animals. People have made it into a custom, right? And then sometimes customs, you know, kind of on their own become like, you know, take on the level of like obligation. But when we look at the roots and when we look at the laws, which is what we have to do, we see that it's not an obligation whatsoever and you're not taking anything away your Seder is still kosher. And again, in my eyes, it's super kosher because the food that you are serving is more in line with another Torah obligation, so by the Chayim, not to cause pain and suffering to animals. So that's why I like to say a, a vegan Passover and a vegan Seder is super kosher. That's so wonderful to hear because I think a lot of people don't know the difference between what is actually custom and what is actually you know Jewish law, like what is actually the must that we have to do and what is actually custom. And that's interesting to hear. So basically, if I understood you correctly, the custom is to, the, the law is to be happy on the holiday. That's the mitzvah. And if you don't have a Beth Mikdash, a temple, then you don't have any obligation to eat part of the sacrifice. Right. And even back then, just as a little, you know, on the side thing for people who like this kind of information, even back then, it wasn't like you were doing a barbecue in your backyard, like in Beit Shemesh you know, for the holiday. It was only in the temple, only in Jerusalem, only from that sacrifice. It was so super specific, right? So um, to take that and transfer it into like our, our private homes, our private tables, like all over the country and say it's a mitzvah, it's an obligation. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't equal out. And in the, the books of Jewish law, they sometimes use the word mitzvah to say it's a mitzvah, but they don't use it uh, to mean obligation. 
sometimes we're, and it's confusing sometimes, but the word mitzvah sometimes is used just like as a good thing to do. We're like, you know, what we do and it's a good thing. Uh, but there are books of Jewish law that will say it's a mitzvah, using that word again, but not an obligation, right? So they're clear to say, but it's not an obligation to eat meat on Passover, on any of the holidays. And these are like standard mainstream, you know, books of Jewish law coming from very well-respected rabbis. That's so, so good to hear. And I think, I hope all of you, you know, who are listening have the answer now to when you get that question from people, like, is a vegan Passover the same as a regular Passover? Is it kosher? Is it, you know, proper in the Jewish law? It absolutely is. In fact, I, I think it was Rabbi David Rosen who said something like there were different times when Jews couldn't, um, get, didn't have access to meat. And it was absolutely permitted to use things like mushrooms or other substitutes because there was no obligation to do to for the mitzvah of eating meat. It wasn't an actual mitzvah. So it was, it's exactly. not the first time. Like, so I have a question. So you're saying like when they came up to the temple with the sacrifice, they had, you know, the custom of eating that little piece of meat. But then at their homes and the, at their Seder tables, was it mostly veggies then? Was it? Okay, so let me. What, so Passover is a little different than the other two different than Shavuot and Sukkot because on Passover you do have the mitzvah, another mitzvah to eat from the Korban Pesach, right? The Passover, the Paschal lamb offering that you brought right. the afternoon before, uh, you know, Passover began that night. So that is, is is an extra thing that Passover had. So you have the the special Korban Chagigah, as we call it, the holiday sacrifice that was brought for the for the for the chag for the holiday, but then Pesach again is 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 unique that it also had an extra thing that you ate at the very end of the seder, and that's why we eat the today. The afikomen that we eat today, the, the matzah, is in place of the korban Pesach that used to be in the temple. Nice. But again, that was only in the temple. We Jews haven't done that in two thousand years almost. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. So now that we've cleared that all up. <laughs> Then how do you do, how does one do a vegan Passover? Like, are you hosting people this year? Have you hosted in the past? Like, how, is there a main thing? Is, you know, are there multiple traditions that goes? Is there a couple of things you have to have on the table? Or Look, so much of what we're eating uh, and is vegan already. Most of the things that we put on our table to help us to tell the story are vegan. The only things that are not are the shank one and the, and the roasted egg, right? Everything else is vegan. Everything has vegetable or, you know, wheat from the matzo, but, you know, the wine. It's all naturally vegan. So it's really interesting just to see that. Most of, you know, the majority of the items that we're, that everyone's putting on their table during the Passover Seder right. is vegan, right? So those couple of things, so you just, you replace them. And again, you don't have to worry about it, think about it, put a beet, put a, 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 a boiled potato instead of the egg and move on. And that's fine. Right? These are all symbols. We have to remember these are all symbols. The maror, which we have to eat, is already plant-based. The matzah, which we have to eat, is already, you know, grain-based. The wine that we have to drink, right, or grape juice, is already, you know, uh, fruit-based. So it, it, it's so interesting to see that the things that we have to eat are already naturally vegan. So basically, my advice is just, you know, uh, switch those couple things on your Seder plate. And then make your favorite vegan uh, dishes that are kosher the Passover uh, for the for the meal, and you're done. You're good to go. Not that much worry. Not that much extra work at all. What are some What are some of the things that are on your uh, seder plate? I like roasted beef just because I like the way it looks, right? Um, and I like to and I use a, a boiled potato for the, for the egg because it's got the same shape. There's all kind of symbolism. And look, custom and symbols are very important in Judaism. I love them. I, I get into them myself. I'm like very into like this symbolizes that. And and when we look at this or do this or use this, we're we're thinking about some. It's great. Judaism is so full of all these meaningful uh, moments of having intention. But again, I can just switch the egg for the for the potato that looks very much like the egg and get the same kind of uh, symbolism. And again, just to remember the roots of it are all custom. This doesn't come from the Torah. We ourselves made, made it up. doesn't take any, uh, any of the beauty away from it, but just, you know, makes us to help, uh, helps us understand where it's coming from and what again is an obligation and what is not. Let me ask you, do you know where, I mean, obviously in Egypt and the Exodus and that, you know, original table, or even the year after when they celebrated the holiday, they probably wasn't an egg on the table. So do you know how that got into the tradition and how well, and why right. that came about? Well, eggs became a, uh, a, a symbol of, of mourning, actually, right? A symbol of mourning. 
okay and uh you know like the, even the roundness of it is like the, the cycle of life okay so because you know on our seder plate like we're remembering jerusalem and we're, we're, we are remembering the temple you know on some level during the passover seder so it's a it's a it's a it's a symbol to help us to remember you know our past jerusalem jerusalem was destroyed the temple was destroyed uh, and even I'll just say again, just quickly on the side, you know, so many I get I get this question all the time, and I know a lot of Jewish vegans and vegetarians have a hard time with the temple and the sacrifices and all that. I think it's also important to remember that most of the things I know that the the main show, the main thing that happened in, in the temple was you know the sacrifice, but most of what was happening every single day was completely vegan, so to speak. Right there was the the lighting of the menorah. There was the lighting of the incense. There was the bread that was baked fresh every single week. There were wine libations. There were grain offerings. So if you just look at it and count them up, most of what was happening was not animal based, right? And I think that's also really important to remember as well. In the inner sanctuary called the Hechal, where like uh, only the Kohanim, uh, only the priests can go into, where you had the menorah and the table and the incense, right? There was no animal sacrifices happening there at all. That only was on the outside part. And in Judaism, the outside part is always looked at as the less significant, and the inside part is always looked at as the main and essential piece. That's that's so interesting. And people are are responding and saying that this is very helpful information because it is a question that you know that we get a lot. I remember um, in DC we we hosted uh, vegan events, and a lot of times people would say, "But then, how is this you know under Jewish law? Like, how is this?" correct and it turns out it was sort of the original in the first place and in fact i've heard that that meat in general was a concession to begin with like it wasn't something that was going to continue it was like after the flood or something like that it was a concession to begin with because the earth had been destroyed and it would take time to plant is that really is that the case or is that yeah, yeah. Rav Cook, Rav, Rav, um, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak of Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi, first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of, of pre-state Israel, one of the greatest rabbis we've had, I mean, for thousands of years, in my opinion, but definitely in the past many, many hundreds of years. He himself, in his own writing, said that, he, just like you said, that it was a concession, that, look, the ideal is Genesis, you know, 129, the, the first diet given by God is, is a vegan diet. And the, 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 why a change? You don't see God changing God's mind so often, you know? And, and it came because of concession that the humanity had lowered itself morally and spiritually. And therefore this is a reflection of that. But Rob Cook himself says, you know, that uh, we're meant to, to return to the original ideal diet one day. And um, I think the more, more Jews and more people in general who become vegan, we're really helping to bring that vision uh, closer and closer. Exactly. So as we, you know, adapt either for Pesach, a vegan past, a vegan Passover, or just in general, a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, we're actually going back to the beings we were meant to be and to the, the highest level of ourselves or the, the best version of us, living the best version of ourselves. Here at Jewish Absolutely. Vegan Life, we always say we're here to help you live your best Jewish vegan life. <laughs> I love like it. We're I love here it. To, yeah, we're here to meet you where you are and help people one day at a time you know, make that transition and, and not just make that transition, but make it a lifestyle. Cause mm -hmm. a lot of times when people try something or make a transition, then, you know, they don't stick to it. And we're here to like, to be supportive all along the way and to show you that they're Jews right now, as you can see from all around the world, um, who are, who are celebrating a vegan Passover. In fact, this year, I think the number is as high as 500,000. Wow. 500,000 Jews worldwide will be sitting down to a vegan Passover. So that's Absolutely. all very interesting. Um, we actually got some very interesting questions uh, for you, which, are, which I'm going to jump back to in a little bit. But I want to um, share, first of all, some customs actually from around the world that, uh, that I learned that might be interesting to, to some of you. So as I said, we all have our you know, own traditions and things that we grew up with, but then Jews come from everywhere in the world. And a lot of us have also mixed backgrounds. Like I myself, I have an Ashkenazi, Shafardic, and I've learned later in life a little bit Mizraki background as well. So we all are this big melting pot and we all have very different traditions. So I'm just gonna share with you guys some that I learned from around the world. So um, Polish Jews, for instance, they have this tradition where they gather in the square, the community gathers in the square, and then they try to fill the square with water, 
uh, of some sort. And then they all stand on one side of that water and then they pick up kinds of the hems of their garments or their jackets or whatever, the tails of their jackets. And they try to jump over the water to symbolize crossing the Red Sea, which is something I'd never heard of or never seen, but apparently that's a tradition there. And of course the Seder plate is this like central part of the table, especially uh, in the States and in Northern America. But for Yemenite Jews, they don't use the Seder plate at all. The table, the entire table is their Seder plate. So they just arrange their um, uh, Seder meal pieces or veggies or what have you on the entire table in an aesthetic way. Similarly, Tunisian Jews do the same thing in which they don't have the Seder plate, but instead of just laying it out on the table, Tunisian Jews actually put it into this little basket, this little uh, wicker basket to symbolize the process that happened with Moshe. And Moses, as you know, he, many of you may know, he was put into a basket and sent down the Nile River to, to save his life. So, um, so they do that, which is an interesting tradition. Um, Persian and Afghan Jews, some of you might know this actually, Persian and Afghan Jews use chives or scallions, however you want to call it, to during the Dayenu, which is at the end of, towards the end of the Seder, they use chives or scallions to lightly hit each other uh, with it, in, you know, in remembrance of the fact that we were slaves in Egypt and, uh, you know, the taskmaster under the taskmaster's whip. So that's also an interesting one. And then in Syria, a lot of Syrian Jews take the Exodus seriously by acting out or react, uh, reenacting the Exodus story. And so they'll put like some matzah into a backpack and throw it over their, you know, back and like walk out with it and recite the Hebrew verse about the, you know, from when we were leaving in the Exodus. So those are just some of the interesting traditions that come from world Jewry that I didn't know about. And I thought I'd share with all of you. And I want to hear from all of you, what are some of your favorite traditions for, for Passover? And did that change once you went vegan and once you went plant-based? Um, and so go ahead and put those in the chat if you have a favorite uh, Passover food that you veganized. And you know now this is your family's, you know you didn't have to drop that favorite food. You could just veganize it. I have a friend uh, in DC. He was really big on chopped liver, which is something I've never tried in my life. <laughs> But I think it's a very popular Ashkenazi thing. And he veganized it. And the recipe was more popular with his family than the original um, family chopped liver recipe. So that's uh, all very interesting. But before we jump into seeing all of your traditions, I want to actually talk about how veganism and plant-based lifestyle is connected to the environment. Because people around you know, always ask me, what are the reasons that you're vegan? Is it a diet thing? And yes, it is a diet thing. Um, you know, this is, I think, the ideal diet for the human body, but it's also for the animals, but it's also for the environment. And I think that's one area that people don't always make the connection. And I remember when I was living in DC, they had all these rallies for um, climate change. And the rallies would be attended by lots of different people and lots of different ad, uh, activists, including vegans. And when we would go to lunch, they would be pizza or burgers, <laughs> believe it or not, for lunch at a climate change event. So clearly, you know, they weren't connecting the dots. And actually to talk a little bit more about that, I want to uh, invite my colleague here at Jewish Vegan Life, Michael Grebov. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, how are you? Great to be here. Thank you for nice to see you. This. I see that you're you have a similar living room that, as I do. <laughs> it's a, it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? It's a it's a popular setup. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> so, uh, um, first of all, hi. Thanks for joining us, and happy early pa vegan Passover to you. you. And, and would you share with us a little bit about the connection between? Um, plant based living and the environment and how it really does directly impact our, our, our choices on our plate really do does directly impact the environment. Yeah, it's really amazing. You know, um, let me just uh, fix my lighting here. Um, it, it's really amazing how the, the connection is so powerful um, because what we eat has a direct impact on the world around us, right? Um, and it's so interesting that the environmental movement does not really sync up with, you know, with, with that realization. There are a lot of 
you know, really passionate um, climate change activists that, you know, are not actually making that next step to change their, um, their, their diet um, to sync up with their goals, you know, and, and the vision that they have for, for the world. Um, so, um, what I, uh, so what I soon realized uh, after I went vegan is that uh, all of the foods that we eat um, have a direct impact on our climate. And that is because now actually we know that all of the latest studies show the biggest impact on the environment, the biggest impact on global warming uh, because of greenhouse gases is animal agriculture. If you, if you take the impact of animal agriculture, it is actually bigger than all of the transportation um, methods, all the transportation uh, options, you know, the, the planes and the trains and the cars, and you add them all up, they're still smaller than animal agriculture. That's the impact of animal agriculture on greenhouse gases because of CO2 emissions, but also because of methane emissions and because of the various chemicals that we use in fertilizer that are even, you know, like a hundred times more powerful than methane or CO2. So uh, all of that adds up to a much hotter climate. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I often think of the Amazon, you know, this is the lungs of the earth. Uh, and this is, um, the, the, uh, at any given point in time, um, because Brazil can kind of you know, and Argentina and these places export so much meat around the world. At any given point in time, there are 200 million cows grazing in the Amazon, right? So you imagine the impact of that. The way that the cows graze, you know, they eat the grass, the grass runs out, the farmers, they chop and burn, chop and burn, chop and burn. They, you kind of do that over and over and over again. That's, that's, the, main, that's the main cause of deforestation. So all these beautiful forests that are giving us oxygen, give, giving us all this uh, clean air to breathe and are also sequestering carbon dioxide, right? They're taking in carbon dioxide from the environment and converting it to oxygen. They're disappearing. They're disappearing because of the largely Western desire uh, of for meat, which is actually damaging to our health and damaging to our environment. So I thought about this because um, today, uh, this year, uh, we are celebrating Earth Day on April 22nd. And um, April 22nd, every year we celebrate Earth Day. Um, but this year, unlike all the other years, we are also celebrating Passover on Earth Day. This year, Passover and Earth Day converge. Passover begins the night of April 22nd, which is which is also Earth Day. And that doesn't happen every year because of the, Incredible. Of the, 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 the nature of the Hebrew calendar. It doesn't sync up with the solar calendar. But this year, they sync up. And the next time that, the, that Passover and Earth Day are going to converge is going to be 30 years from now. So that's going to be in 2054. Um, and it's no coincidence that uh, studies also show that uh, a, trend, a global transition to a plant-based diet over the next 30 years is actually going to be able to reverse and, and make it at least sustainable, the, the, the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. So these things are kind of all converging now you know, uh, on this date. And that's why we have decided to uh, launch a beautiful special campaign called uh, uh, the uh, Passover Earth Day campaign to encourage the global Jewish community uh, and the global community as a whole to celebrate uh, Passover 100% plant-based. And if you're not vegan, to go vegan on Passover because this is the opportunity to uh, really really live this holiday, but also impact not just ourselves and our families, but also the planet, the wider kind of planet around us. Um, and with that, I wanted uh, to play, um, hopefully it'll, it'll sync up here. I wanted to play a quick, uh, a powerful clip of uh, Rabbi David Rosen talking about um, this specific issue. 
Uh, if you don't know Rabbi David Rosen, um, also another powerful rabbi like Rabbi Akiva, um, Rabbi David Rosen was uh, also of, is also the former chief rabbi of Ireland. He's originally from South Africa, but um, he was uh, uh, spent some time in Ireland where he was the chief rabbi. Um, and he does a lot of interfaith uh, work in, around the world, kind of representing the Jewish people to the world and to other faiths. And he's also a member of uh, the Jewish Vegan Life Executive Council. And we interviewed him uh, specifically about, you know, this issue about a vegan Passover and what this means. Um, and so here's what he had to say. Now, what is Pesach all about? Pesach is about redemption. Yes, first and foremost, it's a story of redeeming the Jewish people from slavery. But that is a message that has far wider ramifications of redemption from all forms of slavery. And today, modern society is enslaved to a drug, which is essentially this carnivorous diet that does harm to our bodies, to our communities, and to our planet in itself. And therefore, there is an urgent need to redeem ourselves in environmental sense and to ensure that we do not are not destroyed as a result of this slavery, as threatens to be the case through global warming, which is a direct product of this of such wasteful diet and destructive lifestyles. But to be able to adopt a lifestyle that allows us to be able to continue to flourish and therefore redeems us, celebrates rebirth. And that rebirth is our responsibility for our environment and for the well-being of the world as a whole, especially our responsibility to our own families and our own communities. And therefore, care for the earth, care for our home, care for God's creation, testifying to God's presence is, of course, inextricably bound up with the higher message and purpose of Pesach. And therefore, to be able to have that confluence of Earth Day and Pesach is very significant and very important. Everybody who can celebrate this wonderful convergence, this confluence of Earth Day and Passover should celebrate it and broadcast it so that people are more aware and more appreciative of how Judaism teaches us to care, provide positive stewardship and to nourish the planet of which we are part. When we went out of Egypt, we were not just getting out of a bad situation. Moshe Rabbeinu did not say to Pharaoh, let my people go. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. There has to be a higher goal and purpose of our existence. And we have to continually ask ourselves, are we serving those higher goals for a better world, for a better life, for better communities, for better health, for my better well-being, for my better consciousness and awareness? And I think it's important to say that the real way we can do this in terms of the way we consume and the way we eat and drink today has to be through adopting a plant-based diet. Absolutely, 100%. So that is the reason why the campaign was born. It's actually born out of the story of Passover. And I can share with you, uh, when Michael and I were working on this, in the story of Passover, if you think about it, what you see is that the earth, the planet, is fighting for us. It's fighting on the side of justice. You know, you have with the with the earth opening up, with various plagues, with... with um, the, the fire, the, the, you know, fire that distracted the, the Egyptians, all of these elements that involved the planet, you see that the planet was fighting for justice and for freedom and saying that, you know, all men are created equal and they shouldn't be enslaved. And at the time, these were concepts that nowadays we know because there's this whole social justice movement, but these were the beginnings of the social justice movement. These were the beginnings of you know, uh, Moshe was the first, I think, social justice activist, if you think of it like that, because the first one to stand up and say, I know this has been done for centuries, but what's not going to be done anymore, and there's a better way. And so I think it's now, it's our time on this unique opportunity in which Passover and Earth Day converge to stand up for the Earth and to fight for the Earth. So that way we have a planet for our children and grandchildren, because this is real. And the direction that it's going in is very, very concerning and very serious. And I think this, you know, marking this Passover, beginning the next 30 years until it happens again, we have 30 years to make a difference. 
And that's what this campaign uh, is all about. And I'm gonna invite Michael back just to share a few details and then we'll go to your questions about you know, how you can get involved in the campaign. Sure, yeah, so um, we're gonna be partnering with the Jewish community to really get the word out, you know, as uh, Rabbi Rosen said, to really broadcast this message uh, to, the, to the Jewish world. And uh, we will have a, uh, starting actually tomorrow, we're gonna be sending out a recap and an email with uh, details, uh, this recording and information about the campaign. And you'll be able to sign the pledge uh, to uh, go vegan for Passover and to distribute it uh, to your friends and family uh, in the greater Jewish community and to the institutions with uh, which you are connected. Because ultimately, you know, we can't do this work alone. Obviously, we need ambassadors like yourselves to really help us connect with local Jewish institutions, whether that be Jewish community centers or Hillel's or synagogues. Uh, or day camps to help them participate in the campaign to distribute uh, and to promote this uh, to the broader Jewish community uh, so others too can understand this, this unique confluence, this connection between Passover, between Earth Day, and between what we eat every single day. Yes, absolutely. So keep your eyes open for tomorrow's email. There'll be all the details on that and we are super excited about it and there's actually we're also going to include there there was uh, an article in the jerusalem post about it so that definitely got the word out and rabbi kiva also uh contributed to that article um and that's starting to get the word out and there's going to be more like that we're going to be sharing with you guys so whenever we share those please do your best to share it far and wide and get the word out that this is happening and we have you know, a good, it's a good sense of having that marker to have 30 years to, to make a difference. Um, okay, I want to jump into some questions from all of you. I'd like to actually bring Rabbi Akiva back. Hi, Rabbi Akiva. Um, we're going to take some questions that actually were pre-submitted uh, ahead of uh, ahead of this segment, and then we'll also take some questions from the chat. Do we have the pre-submitted questions? Okay. So um, this question is from Naomi, and she asks, why does Judaism seem to go against vegan ideals? For example, Korban Pesach and not eating not, which leaves us basically with non-vegan options. Rabbi Akiva? Okay, so two really good questions, big questions. I'll answer them briefly. And if you want more information, you can get in touch with me uh, privately. Um, the whole idea of the Korban Pesach connected to all of the Korbanot, all of the sacrifices that were brought in the temple in Jerusalem in the past. We had two different temples at two different times. Well, the same kind of temple at two different times. Um, as we kind of you know uh, referenced before, the sacrifices that happened in Jewish history in the past could only happen and did only happen in Jerusalem in the temple following very, very specific and numerous laws. Um, the Rambam in his book, uh, The Guide for the Perplexed, talks about the, the sacrifices as also kind of being a concession from God to the Jewish people, because that's the way the world was back then. That was the way humanity knew how to serve, so to speak, in a religious or a spiritual way. But it's interesting to see such a great rabbi over 800 years ago uh, speak about the sacrifices as well in that kind of context. Not the ideal, but they were given to us because that, that was the way of the world and can't expect too much, too much from people, so to speak. Um, so yes, it definitely seems, you know, in, in stark contrast to, to the ideals of veganism today, but at the same time, I, I just wrote a post about this last week, literally saying that just because we had sacrifices in the past in Judaism doesn't give any justification for supporting the horrors and the cruelty of the modern day agricultural world of the factory farming and all the animals that are raised in there uh, in horrible conditions and in horrible ways and painful ways just to provide humans with a certain kind of taste for a few fleeting moments today. All right, so that's about sacrifices. There's more about that. In terms of kidney oat, um, you know, kidney oat is also a custom uh, for Ashkenazi. If you're, not, if you're Sephardi, you don't even think about it. I remember when exactly. I first came to Israel 20 years ago, I went to the supermarket um, on, on, on Pesach and I saw kosher for, for Pesach hummus. I'm like, really? No way, really? It was like a funny moment. But I'm like, oh, right, that's for Sephardi. I'm Ashkenazi, so I'm going to eat it. 
Um, so it's really, <laughs> half the Jewish world doesn't deal with Kitniot. And many Ashkenazim have been actually changing their custom in, in recent years for various reasons. Not only vegans, but I know vegans uh, who have started to eat Kitniot. Um, and especially in Israel, it's very, very easy because things are checked and double checked and triple checked. And you have to check it again at home after you buy it. That's the whole thing. But um, it, it's not like an anti-vegan kind of thing. It's just a custom for various reasons, for good reasons. Back in Europe, that these certain grains were, although they're not considered chametz, they were grown or stored in, in close proximity to chametz. And there was a, a concern about cross-contamination where they could be made into bread and then people might get tricked in, in thinking that they're eating chametz and chametz is okay to eat. So there's good reason for it, but it is just a custom. It's not an obligation uh, like what we were talking about before. And um, if, if someone feels like they're vegan and, and it would benefit them to eat kidney oat, talk to your local rabbi and you probably get uh, permission to eat it. Absolutely. I, I eat hummus. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, honestly, I'll share really quickly. I've been, I, I didn't eat kidney oat for over 20 years. And at the beginning of Corona, when we had our first at-home Seder with no guests and nobody, we're like, we have to do something a little different. And we started eating kidney oat in my family, my, my, my nuclear family. And, um, you know, um, it gives more options and, um, you know, it, it is possible. But it's good to know that it's just a custom though. So it's, you know, it's yeah. up to you. If it's something you've always done in your family, you want to keep on, you know, keeping that. Right. Okay. It's not, I will, I will say this. It's one of those stronger customs, you know? So like, if you want to follow all the rules, like talk to a rabbi about it, you know, but there are some people who don't need that and they just kind of make the change on their own, you know, teach their own. But, um, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So let's go to the next question. So Cheryl from California asks, what are some options for Ashkenazi Jews that do not consume beans, rice, or tofu on Passover? Any oh. tips on that? Yeah, because I did it for like over 20 years. Um, and even though I eat kidney oat now, it's not like I'm always eating every meal with kidney oat in it. It's just like an extra thing. But for over 20 years, I did not eat kidney oat as a, as a you know, uh, religious vegan Jew. Um, so yes, quinoa, quinoa, quinoa. All right. Uh, eat lots of quinoa if you want. Uh, if you want to replace those things with something else that is totally fine for, for Pesach, you just have to make sure that in your house to, to check it, you, you know, and make sure you only buy a bag of quinoa that's already been uh, labeled as kosher for Passover and then check it again at home. Um, but that, and then all kinds of other foods, even when I wasn't eating kidney, I'd be, for me, I'll be honest with you, everyone does their own thing. I didn't mind the week off of the normal things that I, I, I'm used to eating. Okay, so no, I don't eat that much tofu anyway. So no beans, no rice, no this. I get it if it's a challenge. I totally get it. For me, it was a nice break uh, from those things. I eat lots of salads on, on Passover, lots of potatoes, lots of matzah. And the next week or the week before, I'll, I'll, I'll stock up on a bit more protein than normal just to balance things out. But you have, uh, you have nuts. You have uh, nut butters. Uh, you can make smoothies, lots of smoothies. Right. Uh, you know, there's tons, especially in our world today, go online. There's tons of amazing vegan Passover friendly recipes. You can be creative. You can eat really well, even if you don't eat kidney oat on Pesach. Absolutely. Those are actually really good options. Quinoa is a, is a big go to for me. Um, and nut butters. Yeah. Nut butter on matzah with some like Ceylon, which is date syrup or, or jam. That's like. A really, a really good option. Um, okay, do we have any other pre-submitted questions? Or should I head over to the chat? Okay, so Huda is asking, are avocado pits and beetroot legitimate halakhic substitutes for beta, which is an egg, and zeroa? So right, so we talked about this before, so the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, I don't know if he's watching live, but... Um, but that's helpful information. Do we have any more questions or should I head over to the chat? Okay, I think I'm gonna head over to the chat. So let's see what people are making. Um, why do people still, are they people still sacrificing animals, Rebecca? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, not in the Jewish world. I, if you can be maybe a bit more specific, are you talking about Jews? Um, I don't know. If, you, if you're still here with us, uh, if you can be more specific about that question, let's you don't see have what else we have. In, in Judaism. What can we say to religious people that claim they kill animals because their nishama needs to go up in scale? So that's a whole path in and of itself. So I'm going right. to 
huge complicated idea from the Kabbalah and give it over in a few seconds. And again, if you want more um, information, be in touch with me. But there is an idea in Kabbalah that, first of all, everything we're doing in the world is tikkun olam or can be tikkun olam, can be fixing the world spiritually, um, especially our eating. That might surprise, and it usually does surprise a lot of Jews that our eating actually plays a great role in tikkun olam. I mean, us Jewish vegans, probably not so much of a surprise, but but it's another amazing thing that, uh, you know, how we eat and, and how we what we eat and how we eat uh, has a huge impact on the world. We know Judaism says so much about what we eat, the laws of kashrut, but also Jewish mysticism talks a lot about how we eat. What are we thinking about when we eat? What are our intentions? What are our thoughts even? Um, so there is this idea of, of elevating uh, the food that we eat uh, to higher levels and, and, and um, elevating the spark, so to speak that are stuck in them. This is, these are kind of deep, complicated, uh, mystical ideas in Judaism. And the, and the Kabbalah says that the most difficult of all foods to elevate the sparks from um, is, is, is animals. And so that's why the Kabbalah actually warns people, beware. Make sure, basic, I'm paraphrasing, but like, make sure you know what you're doing. No, make sure you're on the, the spiritual level to do this spiritual ele elevation, right? A uh, 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 Kabbalist from a previous generation, the Benish Chai, um, he quoted another Kabbalist from a previous generation from him, the Arizal, who said when the Gemara says that uh, uh, an ignoramus should not eat meat, an ignoramus, it says in the Gemara, is prohibited to eat meat. And according to Kabbalah, that's because the, the person doesn't know how to do the spiritual elevation. Right, so that means today in our day and age, I think most people are already out of the out of the uh, the running, so to speak, for knowing for eating meat because they don't know how to do the spiritual elevation. Right, uh, they're not of the right and correct mindset. And as I like to say, and other Jewish vegans like to say, if they are, even if they are, right, which is a very high spiritual level, if they're able to eat with such consciousness and such focus and such mindfulness most likely they're going to choose not to eat the animal because they're concerned about the suffering that the animal went through in the modern day factory farming world. Yeah, I think that's a key point. And you mentioned it before. What was back in the day, even with sacrifices and what was allowed is not what we have today at all. The factory farming that's widespread, even among kosher meat, unfortunately, is the animal suffered. It clearly suffered before it came to its death. And a lot of times, it wasn't even killed according to, you know, it, basically the whole, I'm, I'm not a rabbi, it's up to you to say, but basically the whole idea of how you kill the animal was for the least amount of suffering. But by the time the animals today come to the killing, if you will, they've already suffered more than they're going to at that killing point. So it's something that at this point, I think it's just absolutely you know, there's no use for it anymore. It's not, it's not necessary. Um, let me look over to the questions. There's someone here who says she's making vegan matzo ball soup because her cat's name is matzo. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, I don't know if I can display, can I display that question? Oh yeah, there, her cat's name is matzo. Um, so shout out to Miriam and shout out to matzo the cat. Um, let's see what else people have here. So another person says that she has an easy mock uh, chopped liver recipe. This is a really popular thing. Uh, Rabbi Akiva, are you Ashkenazi? Is this something that you guys ate? This like chopped liver yeah, stuff? When I was a kid, I, I grew up in a very Ashkenazi family. Even though we weren't very Jewish in terms of observance, my my mom's side of the family came from Poland. And so they were very oh. Jewish Ashkenazi in terms of like the food and the language, Yiddish and all that kind of stuff. So I grew up with very Jewish foods actually around the holiday specifically. So I grew up with chopped liver. I, that was one thing I never touched. I'm like, I'm not eating something called <laughs> liver. I never ate it. I, I have had vegan chopped liver. Um, and yeah, people make it out of like eggplant and, and other things. I never made it myself, but I've had some pretty good, I don't know what the original tastes like, but uh, the vegan chopped <laughs> liver was, uh, was, was pretty good. It's not my favorite dish, but it was nice to have. Same here. I never tasted the original. It was not something in my, my mother is Ashkenazi, but she, she cooked mostly food that was just like people make in Israel because we grew up here or right. just I don't know, anything she wanted. Also, my parents are, are interesting. They're Commonwealth Jews who happen to be born in the Caribbean. It's a long story, but wow. there are a lot of influences and in these kinds of things, chopped liver or, you know, gefilte fish was never on our table, but I've tasted vegan versions of this, but like you're saying, I don't know how the original tasted. So I don't know how to compare. These right. were decent. It wasn't my favorite, but it's a popular thing. Right, um, right. 
<laughs> Another person is sharing that they make their chopped liver from mushrooms, onions, and walnuts. That actually sounds, sounds you know, good. on the basis of the flavor is delicious. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. let's see what else we have. Um, I think that's that's it. Um, I do want to share with everyone a couple of things before we let you go. One, remember, um, well, I was just about to say, we do have um, a number of recipes on our brand new relaunched website, uh, jewishveganlife.org. So you can go ahead and check that out. Uh, popular things like matzo ball soup and matzo brai and, you know, all of the favorites. And we're actually going to be including that in tomorrow's email. So keep your eyes open for the email. And then additionally, anybody who has additional questions and wants to really dive into these issues, be sure to be in touch with Rabbi Akiva, which I think that you can um, find you at, what is your handle? Uh, vegan Rabbi on Facebook or Vegan Rabbi on Instagram or akivagersh.com on my website. So basically at the vegan rabbi on social media. Yeah, exactly. At the vegan rabbi. Okay. So do be in touch with Rabbi Kiva and also follow Rabbi Kiva online because he regularly shares a lot of very interesting uh, context on a lot of practices that we, you know, may have either grown up with or, or have had in our, in our life, but we don't know what's behind it. And we don't know how to live our fullest life with those practices in a vegan way. So that's always interesting. I always enjoy seeing your, your post. I'm just checking the questions to see if I'm not missing anyone before we leave everyone. I don't think so. So I want to um, thank you all for joining us and have a happy, uh, healthy vegan Passover. And um, look out for tomorrow's email. And we will see you guys on our next live. Thank you, Rabbi Kiva, for joining us. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Happy Passover. Happy.